Okay, guys. Uh, thank you very much for staying here till late. Um, uh, so today, before that, uh, uh, it's my second time here. Last time, I uh, have also like a talk about uh, machine learning. It was super fun, and I'm super excited to be here again. So uh, thank for the SRT for hosting me, um, and it's like a, it's a great pleasure, really. Thank you. So. Um, today it's going to be like a, a bit more light than last year, and and it's like a progress of what we show last year. So we talk about the perimeter security. We talk about the Active Directory identification of entities. How you can build a profile uh, of your organization. Uh, what's happened in the last three years, and we really identified in the last year, is like everything's going to be external, everything going outside. Uh, people are migrating to the cloud, um, starting with moving their um, mailboxes, and then started to move their data to the repositories there. And uh, um, like we can see that organization today having a lot of issues. Uh, they don't know how to take what they actually build, all the compliance, the policies, and everything that they actually build, and take that to, to the cloud in a mature way and fast enough like the executive want them to take it. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, what's going on in the external perimeter. We're going to talk a little bit about cloud, a little bit about VPN, uh, how today organization allowing to uh, external entities, if there are users or services or uh, supply chain, uh, third parties, vendors, to actually access the network and what are the risks, what we are seeing uh, in the day to day and um, which type of tools you can use in order to have better detection for your blue team, for your SOC team, uh, um, to identify and have more visibility around those type of issues. Um, we, we will have, it's something around 30 minutes of session and uh, we will have like more than five, 10 minutes uh, to Q and A. So um, remember what we're going to ask and you can also interrupt me in between, it's okay. Let's, let's flow with that. Um, so basically, you don't know me. Uh, my name is Nir. I just actually moved for, from Tel Aviv to New York three months ago. Um, as part of my work at Veronis, I'm managing all the cybersecurity activities, the research teams, the forensics team, data science teams uh, uh, from the R&D, and now we're expanding in the United States as well. Um, um, my background is... Mostly I started as a developer, um, assembler, C, C++, going through um, red teaming, uh, penetration test around web application, up to, up to ATMs and airplanes. And um, recently, um, working in uh, Veronis, uh, what Veronis is doing basically is identifying insider threats and advanced persistent threats. Sounds very specific, but this is what we this is what we do in Veroni. So uh, we have some cool out of the box identification stuff. So you can ask me about it later on, and it's also related to what we're going to hear today. Um, let's move forward. So already did an overview of uh, we're going to talk about how the risk uh, landscape is expanding uh, to while like having more resources on the cloud. Uh, we going, I'm going to share some stories from the last five months uh, uh, from our incident response team and forensics team from the field, what we actually seeing, what's, what, what's the challenges of our hundreds of customers that needs to uh, uh, answer those type of challenges. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's very straightforward, and sometimes just to know what's happened, it takes us like, two, three weeks just to understand what's the impact and what is the actual incident. And uh, we talk about the blue team challenges and a couple of ways maybe you can address them and solve them. Okay, so um, if you don't know, those are like very, very uh, big and very new uh, incidents. Um, 
Citrix, I think two weeks ago. Uh, just uh, I'm updating this slide every time that I have like a talk or a training. So Citrix being act. Um, actually, they didn't disclose much information. Um, so they talk about brute force. Some security firm talk about Iranian threat actors. Uh, so basically, the the what 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 I'm trying to pass in this type of slide is like. The information security is like, it's a big thing. Everybody investing a lot of money, but still incidents happen and they happen to the best of the best. Citrix is super strong company. Box, uh, a company that actually like uh, Airbus, uh, airport companies, banks, financial institutions. It's like, assume breach. I think it's the number one concept everyone needs to understand. Regardless of the security and the perimeter security measurements you have in place, you're going to be breached. Uh, my perspective is after the attacker will get into the organization, after he will eventually use phishing, scan your network, find some, I don't know, um, backdoor and some port and service open by mistake, he will get in, but then the game is actually starting. So as long as you be strong within the organization, in the internal organization, in your architecture, and in your application, um, this is how far the attacker can go in short time. So it's a matter of time and matter of impact. How much impact the attacker can do in how much time. So if you have a very strong um, uh, internal um, infrastructure, you will be pretty fine unless someone gets some very strong persistency in your network. So box again, it's like, you see like everything is related to data. Terabytes of data exposed from companies that using cloud-based box accounts. So it's cloud, it's box. Uh, this one, we actually found this one. It's a, a, a browser, a man in the browser, a, a new variant of malware that we actually identified the command and control server that was still on. So, so this one is very relevant to the cloud because most of the authentication for Office 365 a lot of, of the authentication of the sensitive information, certificate, tokens, everything is uh, also like most of that coming and using the actual browsers. So if you have a malware, if you have an add-on and some malicious stuff within your browser, it can be much more effective for the attacker using cloud applications. So I believe you already know that. Uh, just a quick overview of public, private, and hybrid. And then, uh, so, so public cloud is actually, I have a cloud provider, the cloud provider do everything for me. The network, the maintenance, the infrastructure, the bandwidth, everything uh, I need, it's there. It's a public cloud, so everything I have is there. Uh, no communication to the on-prem, just a public, public cloud that doing everything. Uh, private is the opposite. Private cloud is, I have my own resources, with my own resources, I will uh, uh, maintain them, manage them, work on scalability, do whatever I need, but uh, I am the only uh, organization that can use those resources. Even if those resources are, are um, actually, uh, if I use like a managed services for those resources, those resources are still mine. So this one is a private cloud, the hybrid cloud, which is the cloud platform that we're going to talk about today more, is the combination of both. I think it's like the best way to do that. Um, I, I was like talking with uh, several customers and prospects and they told me, we're going to move to the cloud and it's going to take us one year. Uh, I just want to ask you, someone, if someone here think that moving all the organization from on-prem to the cloud can be reached in one year? It's, it's very intense. It can be, nothing is impossible, but it's very intense. Basically, what I'm seeing is taking around two, three years to do like kind of fully migration into the cloud. So to do that migration, organization today usually working with hybrid. So hybrid means that they have some kind of private cloud on-prem or on private cloud outside of the company. And they also have uh, uh, the public cloud, which they can store and maintain using the cloud provider, which is Google Cloud or Azure or AWS 
all the things that they need uh, there. So it's kind of mixed with what I own and I manage and what I have in the, plab, in the public cloud. So in a security perspective, private cloud can be very helpful because it's very dynamic. You can do whatever you want. It's, it's your own cloud. You can define the security. You have no restriction. You can do whatever you want. Most of the organization, like big banks, financial institutions, organizations that needs to comply to policy and regulation usually go into the private cloud because they already built something that everybody sign on and all the other companies know that they need to work like that. So they keep the same thing on the private cloud. Other organization, like more business uh, uh, related organization, most of them actually going and working on the hybrid. So um, this one is actually the cloud environment and this one is the on-prem. So what we have in, in, in the graph and then we will talk about the risk landscape. So we have Azure AD and we have the, so, so let's start with the on-prem actually. So everybody know Active Directory, right? Active Directory manage all the permission, all the groups, all your users, everything you have within the domain, all domains you have in your actually on-prem Active Directory infrastructure. Uh, besides that, you have all the file services, NAC devices, Windows servers, uh, Linux, everything that you actually store data at. Uh, you have your users, users or services or computer accounts, sorry. You have uh, applications. Those applications can be your own application, can be application you actually bought. Uh, and things that we're going to talk about more, so I actually put like, the icon of them is VPN, proxy, and DNS. It's components that usually turn into the external uh, uh, network and also the internal network. And they're like very important for attackers to use, abuse, or get for reconnaissance into actual data exfiltration. Uh, so this is the on-prem. Everybody knows the on-prem. Last year, we, we actually talked about the on-prem. Now we want to see how all the cloud stuff coming together with what we already know from the on-premise environment. So in the cloud, we have Azure AD. If uh, today, when I'm talking with organization and, and CISOs, uh, sysadmins, like long time in the business, they're trying to take all they have in the actual Active Directory on-prem and to implement exactly the same on the Azure AD. It's not going to work. Um, you have so many different things in Azure AD, in the cloud. It's, it's totally different. If you will take what you do in Active Directory on-prem and do the same in Azure AD, you will have many security issues. You will not cover most of the stuff and that even the terminology is different. You don't have domains, you have subscriptions, uh, uh, you have tenants. Um, so it's, it's, it's totally different. The administrators are different. You have service principles. You have a different type of service accounts that actually maintain different type of application. So all those type of things actually totally different from the Azure AD and the on-prem. And we will talk about it as it actually connects to the risk and which type of attack you actually can implement on it. Uh, you have your own application which you actually uh, stored on the cloud and those applications working with your cloud environment and maybe also with on-prem if it's hybrid. And you have a, a, the SaaS application in Office 365, which is SharePoint Online, Exchange Online, um, maybe Box, Dropbox, all those applications that you actually use. And you have also storage. You want to store, you want to do some backup, put some backup on the cloud, things like that. So it's looks like it's very similar to the on-prem, but they have many kind of control measures that you need to take. This one is the actual portal. Um, we're going to talk more about Azure less than other cloud provider uh, because I don't know, I have more experience with Azure today. So I feel more comfortable to talk about Azure. Uh, so in Azure as well, you have the portal that if you want to connect to manage your cloud environment in different type of ways, you can use that specific portal. So who are the entities that actually connecting to the cloud and how the cloud is communicated with the on-prem? You have the users, users, their devices, and, and bring your own device actually can connect your phones. If you have the phone from wall, connect to the uh, exchange online and you can see the emails that you get and everything. So it's directly connected to the cloud environment. 
uh, you have the administrators. The administrators can use the portal, can use different type of authentication. We will talk about it as well. And they can manage all the cloud environment, sometimes from the outside with external IP from their own actual home network. And something new that it's become very, very strong in the security phase is the DevOps users. Is the actual user that doing all the uh, implementation of codes, uh, code management, uh, um, doing the, the, the DevOps stuff on all the application that actually live in on the cloud. Uh, and they actually like, it's, it's part of the functionality. This is why organization moving to the cloud to allow this type of very quick uh, uh, adjustment to application, com uh, commit and, and code the uh, uh, repositories. And those specific user, from what I'm seeing, you have so much issues, so many issues with connecting to the cloud environment. So as an attacker, the first thing I will do, I will look for those type of users. I will look to the, the thing that those users may use in order to access the portal or access those type of application. Because usually in, I think, 90% of the organization that we actually came through and work with, those users actually and administrators. So they have so many privileges. They have privileges of subscription. And as I mentioned, subscription for me is like a domain. So if you're like a subscription admin in the cloud, it's kind of a domain admin. You're in charge of all the subscription, all the content. You can do a lot of things and you can elevate some other privileges if the uh, permission does not manage correctly on the cloud. And tell you the truth because it's kind of new and you're taking people from the IT and the network management from the old, uh, let's say the old days, the, 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 they doing the, the same thing for 10 years and then you take them and you say, do some things on the cloud and they do some training, but it's the same mindset. And the problem with the people that stand with the same mindset, it's open a lot of security issues. So specifically in the permission and specifically on those users, the DevOps users. What's the type of authentication? What are the, the legs and access point that they actually use on the cloud? Um, so Azure AD in hybrid solution use a uh, different type of services in order to, uh, services of service in order to communicate and sync within the actual on-prem. This one, I think it's number one risk and number one thing that we can focus on as an attackers. Uh, so we have the Azure AD Connect. Uh, so Azure AD Connect, uh, you have a dedicated service account. And that service account is super powerful. It's actually migrating passwords, migrating information from the on-prem to the cloud, vice versa. It depends on the actual implementation of your network. Uh, and it's super, super critical, something that you need to take care of in your most like most valuable stuff. It's, it's exactly like the domain controller. Uh, you have the service account of it, and that service account is super powerful. It's one of the privilege accounts you have in the cloud. Um, you have the users, and you have the actual application that run in on-prem, but want also to communicate with the application on the cloud. Uh, you have different type of implementation for that. Most, the most common one is the federation. So they have. It, they have the federation authentication. So here uh, in the DMZ, usually they have like a web server that's called the federation web server that actually uh, is stored certificate and used to uh, authenticate, to do the same authentication from the on-prem to the cloud application using that users. So in the best ways, uh, you have like a policy restriction of IPs and segmentation. So if you're working from your own network, uh, you will have the certificate and your own device, you have the certificates, you have the authentication, users, passwords, everything you need. You will be authenticated and everything going to be good. Uh, uh, and if you try to do it outside of the organization, some organization will block you. It's very rare, but I saw, I think, three that's actually doing that. So it's pretty rare. Yeah, I think, no, four because, yeah, four organizations actually doing access restriction on the federation. 
So, so basically, it's like a web application, web server outside. That web server contains certificates. Those certificates are super critical. If you have those certificates, you can do the authentication to the Azure AD automatically. And maybe sometimes uh, uh, the using our, the actual users that live in on-prem and living the same on the Azure AD, having the same password. So here you don't have like the Kerberos tickets and Kerberos thing and harvesting the Kerberos, cracking them, taking the, the, the actual password. You have the XAML, you have different type of uh, uh, access token. So it's a bit different. But if you actually get the username and password, it's the same. The username and password are the same here and there. And from that on, you can continue and do whatever you want. If it's an hybrid, you take control over the cloud, you take control most of the time over the uh, actual on-prem environment, in most cases. I don't know the, the actual red teamer that have control on privileged accounts in the cloud, and after one hour maximum will not have any control of privileged accounts on the on-prem, with the configuration that I'm seeing today. So we talk about the federation, we also talk about the actual AD Connect. Uh, that specific also, uh, Microsoft have some default configuration for those type of uh, 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 accounts and service account. That service account also have some, some problematic configuration. Uh, for example, um, some configuration in Active Directory that allow you to do DC sync. If you know about the things about DC sync, it's like you don't need to be domain admin. You can use that uh, action in order to uh, replicate and move like all the ash credentials from the domain controllers. So it, I don't want to go into details too much, but it's like it's very bad and you need to look for those permission. Each and every service account, uh, service principal, each and every account that actually have those type of privileges, you need to monitor that and you need to you need to uh, uh, put in place the right permissions. I think it's the, the right start. So we talk about the web-based authentication. You have CLI, dedicated CLI access. Uh, usually the DevOps can use that in order to authenticate and perform a, a operation in front of the cloud. Uh, you have a very, very nice documentation about PowerShell functionality. And we love PowerShell, of course. Uh, Azure Graph API, we usually use that in order to do some auditing and to monitor the traffic and the events that actually happening in the cloud environment. So if you have like a, a SOC team, if you do some blue teams uh, activity, uh, it's very nice to look on the Azure API and Graph API to take some information from there. And we will talk about which type of information we will let you look on. So... Before you continue, we didn't talk about the actual VPN. So yes, we have the cloud, but VPN is still on. Um, so back in the days, like I think one and two years ago, we talked about VPN and how to bypass VPN. Same issues are still here. Talking about the cloud, we have more issue than actual VPN because VPN depends on the vendor authentication. It's pretty straightforward. You have brute force, you have phishing, uh, you have uh, accounts without MFA, uh, you have like specific use cases, which is very straightforward, and the risk is still there. And most of the time, when you want to do like a spear phishing or to attack like a black box attack, I will target VPN users and I will target the VPN users without MFA. So the VPN uh, usually used also by those external users. If you want to connect to your actual organization, you will use the VPN. Um, and the VPN have a lot of information that can help you to understand where the user come from, how the user use the VPN, and if it's a risk or not. And this is one of the source parameter that you really want to look on, uh, the VPN. Um, something very, very nice that I saw in the last year is the supply chain issue. So we work with a third party company and that third party uh, company actually working with one of your internal application. So you open some kind of VPN connection from your uh, segmentation, internal segmentation through a VPN to the service uh, provider or the third party company. The problem with that is it, uh, some of the restrictions that you have on the VPN from that company is very low. One, they have a global account. That global account is being used for different people in the company. So you need to segregate. You need to understand which type of APIs, which type of people can access your environment 
from the third party vendor and then to apply the specific VPN accounts for each and every account that actually use it. Permissions, of course, and also, <clears throat> sorry, and also uh, uh, they have a specific segmentation. If you ask third party vendor to run APIs, they usually run from their own segmentation of IPs. If I know the segmentation of the companies that work in with me and accessing my internal network, I can maintain that as a policy within the VPN configuration and then to have access control and that access control will allow me if someone will take that account or that specific uh, credential for the VPN, they will not be able to access because also I implemented a specific IP range that can use those credentials or those type of accounts. So I think uh, this is like something that most of you or maybe know if you're from the offensive side, but people from the defen defense side uh, managing the security, they have a lot of trust in multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication is something you have and something you know. I need to drink, sorry. I think every, everybody know what is multi-factor authentication in this room, right? So what we what we actually what the research team uh, uh, actually done is like we mapped a specific service account, we mapped specific account that you cannot apply two-factor authentication on if it's on the cloud or maybe some kind of ways that they're using the VPN. For example, um, emergency access account. So this one is a quote for, we found it in the Microsoft, uh, config, um, Microsoft best practices documentation. So if you have a cloud environment and you have administrative accounts, okay? So it's super funny. So the accounts with the highest privileges, maybe you can lock them down, maybe something bad can happen and you need a backup plan. So the backup plan is to have at least two users, and those two users will have the same privileges as the administrative accounts, and the recommendation is not to apply multi-factor authentication using mobile, those type of things, on those super sensitive accounts. So what we did is, you have a lot of scripts in the internet as well, but we built a script that actually map all the user accounts without MFA, uh, in the cloud environment, and we saw, like in, uh, we run over five organizations, and we saw that uh, we have uh, something around 15%, 10%, I don't remember correctly, between 10 and 50% of the user and service account together that not using, not implementing MFA. While I was talking with the head of security of the company, he told me, yeah, we fully migrated with MFA. I, and I told him, it's, it's, it's not reasonable. You have service account. You have like accounts that cannot react to a challenge, cannot do multi-factor authentication. It's not reasonable. You cannot take all your user accounts and service accounts and do, okay, those are all MFA. And then I look for a specific user account or service account that could not have an MFA. And this one, I think, super interesting uh, example, the emergency access account, which are the highest privilege accounts and Microsoft saying, and, and I know what they're saying, and they also have like other access control, which are like lower, but uh, they say do not use MFA for those accounts just in case you don't want to lose your control over the cloud environment. Uh, regardless for that, legacy, of course, you have some legacy services, legacy application cannot use MFA, service account, we talk about it, MSPs. If you are an MSP or you're using MSP, um, they will, they, it's like it's very problematic with them to, to, to work with multi-factor authentication because they have different type of people that managing many customers and many customers have many administrative accounts. So it's very problematic. It's not effective for them to do this kind of widespread MFA implementation. So it's another loophole. So if I want to act organization or I want to understand which well, I will find the weakest link and the accounts that I want to take advantage of, I will look for those accounts without the MFA. And you have pretty much a lot of them. But actually, uh, ah, okay, it's another example. So six months ago, 
uh, um, Azure was actually down. They have some problem with generating the multi-factor authentication. It's kind of a denial of service. I don't know if it's a human error or something happened to the service. And then organization cannot actually authenticate to the mails, to the emails, share points, everything. So those things also happen. You, you, you know, like every organization, it's like it's very, very common and it's very, it's okay. We're all human. We have mistakes. But you need to take into consideration that those type of things happen. It's a red flag to everyone and say, okay, Microsoft has no MFA. Everybody will tone down the MFA. All the accounts will be open to brute force, password spraying. This is why I want to go in to do what I need to do. So if you're, if you're working with Microsoft, it's very, very rare. But if you're working with other service provider, which are smaller, uh, and working with other a multi-factor authentication type of services that can be down, and then you need to maintain your business. Then you, you will exclude, okay, today, no MFA, we have some problem in the service, and then something bad can happen. So you, if you, the, the thing is like, do not put your trust on MFA. MFA is one security layer, and not everything you need, okay? Um, Something very useful for external attackers is like, I don't know what's going on in the network, we will do DNS recon. Uh, I want to talk about DNS recon not because it's new, it's because it's very hard to identify. And I'm going to talk more about like the blue teaming stuff here. So DNS is less monitored than Active Directory. I see a lot of penetration testers, they don't care if they're going to be cut or not because it's part of the assessment. So they will use LDAP query, they will query the Active Directory, all the security solution will shout, eh, someone is using a query in all Active Directory, a lot of LDAP queries. Yeah, it's very straightforward, but if you're actually going to hack an organization, you want to avoid in the first place to access Active Directory because it's heavily monitored, it's, it's the crown jewel. So the thing is like I usually go into on the DNS. Why? Super noisy. They have most of the information I need. So all the service, all, all the servers, all the machine names, everything is stored in the DNS. So if I'm into an organization, new organization, I want to understand when I am, what's the segmentation, what's the device names, everything, I can extract that from the DNS. And the thing is like, it's a very great white smoke. Each organization that I actually met and I asked them, what are you doing with DNS? How are you monitoring DNS? Say, we look for DNS tunneling. Actually, pretty straightforward. DNS tunneling is not something so complicated. See a lot of requests with a unique uh, uh, subdomain to the same domain and a lot of failures. And then you have success sometimes. Pretty, pretty simple huh? to, to create this type of rule. But the thing is like the reconnaissance is much more complicated because reconnaissance can be valid. Uh, we will talk about it as well. So it's very hard to avoid false positives. And when I talk about reconnaissance, um, I'm talking about finding some MX records, finding some interesting services, identify security vendor domains. If you're talking about the cloud environment, most of the records actually like uh, uh, signing in like in the external uh, records or the DNS, so you, c you can actually query that. If you're looking on the internal domain, if you have some foothold within the internal domain, you have the reverse lookup option, which is my favorite. My favorite for reconnaissance. The reverse lookup is I will give you the IP address, you will give me the host name. So I can take the segmentation that I'm in now or all the organization segmentation, but it's going to be noisy. And then to query for the server names. After that, I know which type of server and which IP. So I can start my lateral movement, my attack, find vulnerabilities and more scanning. So it's like very, very uh, pre-exploitation phase. Uh, and this one can be very, very noisy if you want to track it without the sufficient information that you have. Uh, zone transfer, all news, I think it's like, it's not relevant. It's very rare to be relevant, but it's good to have. And many more options with DNS. You have so many information there. So let, let's talk a little bit about detection. So the query type, in DNS you have so many query type. If you want to look for recon, look for PTR request for most of the cases. A reverse lookup for recon using the PTR, authoritative, uh, authoritative, authoritative flags, and upstream traffic. This one is number one false positive reduction in DNS. So if I will do a DNS recon, 
why I want to go outside of the network that I want to do reconnaissance of. So I will look for people that actually doing the reverse lookup queries just within the network. So I have some flags in the DNS that tell me that if the DNS server, my DNS server, didn't find the record, is is sending the request upstream that to ex to the external network. The only problem there is like if you have multi layers of DNS servers. So sometimes the upstream is not a really upstream; it's just a different zone or different segmentation with the network. So you need to play with that. But for that, usually I will exclude DNS to DNS traffic, for example, because it's not so. If you took control over my DNS server, so you will do different stuff than reconnaissance, right? You already have the DNS. So, uh, first of all, understand the query types. After you understand the query types, you need to understand the flags. After you understand the flags, you can avoid the false positive of upstream and downstream in, in internal queries and upstream external queries. Super valuable to detection and to avoid noise. Uh, noisy server, what's going on? So, you have many applications that may have using DNS for resolving. So some application, to, uh, some application or service account of application will be up every one day, two days. IP addresses are changing, and sometimes they're using the VP, the DNS in order to, sorry, in order to resolve the IP addresses into host name, and it's valid. This is what they do. But the thing is, those specific applications do it in specific time most of the time on specific segmentation. If you can learn or map that activity, you can reduce the false positive and the noise by looking on the flags and by looking on the segmentation and the IPs. Um, again, uh, remove DNS to DNS traffic. For me, it's not really valuable. If you see some valuable stuff that of communication between DNS to DNS, let me know. It's, I know like two stuff, but it's not so interesting by me. But let me know after the, co uh, the talk, and it's interesting, actually. Fishing in the cloud, it's so fun. So everything is external. Everything is external, so we have, we have some, some very good stories about it. And, um, people overly trust the per perimeter solution, so if they have sandboxing in the email, if they have content filtering, uh, threat intelligent reputation, uh, they really trust in it and say, okay, if I got an external email, it's bypass all the security mechanism that I have on my email, that's it, I'm fine. Not, it's not, because today you have the macro, the DDE, you have so many vulnerabilities, you have PDFs with JavaScript within, you have PowerShell man uh, manipulation, you can put, actually, uh, everybody knows that, like malicious code within images. So... It's not really helpful. It's helpful to reduce the 90% of the stuff, but if something really bad will happen, it will get in. So do not trust only the sandboxing and the mail reputation. Uh, the impact is much greater because if you have cloud services, so the exchange online will have, a, a, if you, you, you actually access to the cloud and you have the exchange online, you can, you can do so many things and you can go from them to the on-prem very, very easily. Uh, hybrid, again, if you own the cloud, you own it all, in most cases. So, some, some uh, cool stuff that I actually saw. Um, one organization actually been affected by phishing, and that specific organization use MFA, and the specific account that have been compromised, some of them, few of them was MFA, a related accounts. So the phishing actually identified, because everything is external, you can scan, you can take the actual record, they actually ask the user to provide the token. So if you ask for username and password, you can also ask for the token. So what we assume, we don't actually saw the, the, the attacker server or the code, but what we assume is when you enter the username and password, automatically he asks you for the token, the actual uh, uh, MFA. And if you provide it, automatically they have scripts that are taking all those three components and authenticate by behalf of you. And they actually being compromised, they fish the MFA token. It's, it's like, it's very simple because if you ask for password, you can ask for the token. And it's actually happened to a customer a couple of months ago. 
it's, it's, it was, for me, it was amazing because I think it's the second time I saw it, but it's very straightforward. You ask questions, you get answers. That's it. Um, this one is an example of something that we actually ran in, in the company. So a phishing, phishing email that actually, I know that you're like a Microsoft shop and you have SharePoint online. So you actually can disguise yourself as a cloud application. It's very, very common today. We saw some, if you know the Emotet uh, malware, uh, we, uh, we actually identify some of the threat actors that try to, after the first infection, to use the SharePoint Online for internal distribution. What Emotet usually do is like, they taking control of the account and then sending internal email to all the recipients within the company. So we saw this type of behavior that someone is trying in a very bad way, but the idea was very good, to actually use the SharePoint in order to distribute the malware. So it, it's very, if you see an email from your own colleague or just an internal guy within the company that say, it's like, guys, please sign this report as soon as you can. And it's actually, it's actually from the internal organization. You know, you're working with SharePoint online. So you will click on the link, you will download the file and that's it. It's very high fidelity phishing attempts. So if you can bypass F, uh, MFA and you can use phishing, you can use the Office 365 phishing to out, actually outmaneuver some very, very uh, trusted uh, security solution. I think it's very, very cool. Uh, some cool stuff that we actually saw in the wild, uh, pony code exploitation. So uh, today people starting to look more and more on the URLs. So before you actually click on something, you check if the URL is okay. Actually, the, the, the cloud URLs, specifically Azure, because they have the token sometimes, it's very massive. And actually, I've, I've fallen like one, like scam of my teammate that actually sent me some phishing on the cloud. We, we do it to each other sometimes. And it's like, you cannot look on the URL. It looks, it's so long with a lot of numbers and, and you see that every, it, it's actually Azure and, uh, so, so the pony code is taking like ASCII characters and specific characters that looks, uh, uh, um, that you sign the domain. It looks like one way, but they actually like different type of domain. So it's something that you can uh, read about. You, you, we have like four or five different type of pony code relevant uh, phishing attempts that actually you see one URL, but on the um, back scene, it's actually other like, different URL. Uh, let's talk about file activities. Um, if, if anyone here is like uh, in charge of sensitive data in the company or if something bad will happen to sensitive data, it's something that you need to act on, like data management, things like that. Okay, cool. So the cloud is jungle. Uh, you have Teams and you have SharePoint Online. The thing with Teams and SharePoint Online is it's like uh, if you not play with that, you will not understand how much is out of control. In your on-prem, you have permissions, you have access permissions. You have sensitive file, you have regulated file, GDPR, CCPA, I don't know, those type of files that you need to keep and you need to keep safe and you need to monitor. Those specific files have specific access rights. So what's happened is, you know, if you want to access a file you don't have access to, you will not be able to access to it unless you exploit something or steal identity or compromise an account. But what's happened in the cloud is you upload a file and af after you upload a file to one location, you can share that file with anyone. You can share the file with the whole company. You can share the file with other employees in the company. You can share that file sometimes externally. And after, and, and it's, it's not a bug, it's not a sec, it's a security risk, but it's a feature. This is how SharePoint work. This is how uh, teams work. This is how the collaboration of files work. It's, it's part of the feature. From my experience, and I'm working closely with file management and data management, you cannot fight it. The only thing you can actually do is you can monitor it. So if you want to fight it, just close everything. Uh, I think it's very good to close External sharing, uh, it depends on the organization. So if you close all the external sharing and provide external sharing for a specific site or specific people within the organization, the risk will be reduced dramatically, but you still have people that can share 
external external files you can you still have system administrator you still have a, a network administrator that can change those i don't know configurations sometimes somewhere so the thing is like you need to monitor uh, in active there in um, azure uh, graph api you can track events of sharing activity in sharepoint online so every time that people are sharing files, you can monitor that activity. And I really, really suggest you, first of all, to close all external uh, uh, sharing and to close uh, and to take those specific events and to monitor those specific events. It's very noisy, but it's better be safe than sorry, right? You can do it in a more smart way using file classification, which can give you more context about which type of file you actually share or not. Uh, some, I think some very cool stuff around it is if you have a, a team site, okay? You have one group in team. You have one team site. And you know that team sites can access specific information. And that specific information is stored on SharePoint Online. Till now, it's all good. We have teams, and each team has specific uh, access to specific files or places in SharePoint Online. So if you will take specific file and share that specific file with different person outside of the team, it will, you will not see it as the team members. You will not see it in the actual interface that he can access the file, but he actually can access the file. You can see that only if you go to the advanced manage uh, uh, permission on the office, uh, on the SharePoint online interface. So, even if you see that you have specific people that can access specific file, sometimes it's not enough. You need to dig down to, do, to go to the management, permission management, and then you can see other people outside of the group, outside of the actual real permission for those specific files that can actually access the files that you don't want them to access to. Only because someone is shared that with them. And you don't see that from the actual interface. What what uh, I I usually see that our organization trying to solve it is they doing a permission, they blocking everything on SharePoint Online and managing the permission using Teams. The only problem managing the permission using Teams is sometimes it's not reflect what you have in Active Directory, so the access management is different. Okay, but it's a point that you need to take into consideration. Again, share with everyone. Uh, last story about, uh, I will, I will tell you something that we saw like one, one month ago and how to detect it. I will do it fast and then I will leave like 10 minutes for questions if you have. Um, so we jump into a call of a customer and the customer told us that we have some strange threat model, strange alert, and they seeing some strange behavior around someone that is like an IT admin for eight years in the company. And they don't know what to do because they have access and he usually part of the investigation. So we jump in and this is what we saw. We saw like the IT guy uh, uh, created a new user account. And that specific user account, uh, it, it's a new, new account with no special permissions. And then the, he added specific permission to uh, exchange online mailboxes. Um, those six exchange online mailboxes was uh, three of them or four of them related to executive, the CFO, financial manager of the company, the procurement, and and one for the HR that actually in charge of salaries, and the others, like two others, are his team members mailboxes, which is can be maybe maybe okay because they all working in IT and they need some stuff. So, but why he needs to provide a shadow user access to those type of emails. So we saw that that specific user actually read those emails. He read around 30 and 40 emails. It was not automatically read. We can see on the actual timestamp of the events, but we can see that he actually read more than 30 or 40 emails in 20 minutes in each and every uh, uh, mailbox he actually access to. After he, uh, he done it, he access specific location in the network. You can look on Active Directory for those type of things. And he look, he access to specific devices and shell folders and access for specific uh, uh, 
Excel, Excel, Excel files with name convention that uh, resides of salary and things like that. So he sent some emails to himself to non-related Gmail account with several files that he actually found. He zipped them and they sent them to the Gmail and that's it. This was the incident. So what we, uh, after that, we, we gather all the, all the information. And after that, the CISO uh, give, gave me a call and he told me that this guy is working eight years in the company. He didn't get a salary raise for three years. And then he wanted to know how much he can ask and how much other people actually got. So he created the user because he was thinking he's a smart guy. So he created the user. That user actually provide the permission because he have the ability to do that. Read the emails and send some some stuff so we can walk at home and look on the numbers. He don't he didn't want to do it on at the office. So this is how we caught him. And I don't know what what actually happened to the IT guy, but so so what 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 type of things that we are looking at? A suspicion permission. If someone is providing permission to mailboxes in Exchange Online or even in Exchange or just mailbox, many permission to different mailboxes, which those mailboxes are not the public mailboxes, like first red flag. Access to executive or sensitive personal mailboxes. So executive mailbox and VIP mailboxes should be heavily monitored. And if someone wants to have access to, we need to make sure that he actually needs to have access to it. Uh, reading emails in not automatic e uh, way. So usually you're not reading like 30, 40 emails in 20 minutes if you're the IT guy. If you're other guy, the marketing or finance, maybe. Uh, access to suspicious devices. It's, uh, it's all about knowing your organization. If you know the organization, you know which device related to which person. It's easier. You need to have some kind of database, some kind of machine learning based behavior profile that can identify it, or you can, during the investigation, go over the devices on Active Directory and identify the device name and check if those device names, those shell folders, actually relevant to the job of the IT guy. Uh, and upload data, so if you monitor the proxy, and if you also monitor some file activity on specific location, you can correlate that information and to understand, together with all that activity, if something being exfiltrated or not. So those are the red flags that we actually saw, and we're able to solve the mystery of what's actually happened. Um, so we will jump, we will jump to the Q, sorry, to the Q&A to the Q&A section. So guys, if you have questions about the cloud, about what we actually saw, about the malware we found, any questions? It was fast. Any questions? Cloud security, monitoring. A few minutes for that. Well, if there are no questions, then thank you for the talk. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>